Rabishaka, Rabishaka, Rabishaka. Catchy, isn't it? Stay tuned, find out what it means. Hey, welcome to Sea uh, Life with Daryl Chesser. Uh, been a long time since I've been uh, on by myself and done one of these, but today I wanted to step up and do some. Uh, we are uh, a lot of friends, a lot of family, you know, things that this, the world is crazy right now. It's kind of fun to, uh, to think you're kind of isolated, but then you start to talk to people from all over the world and you realize, no, pretty much everybody's kind of here. I mean, it just seems like weirdest stuff and, and just things that have just persisted and gone on and gone on. And whether it's finances or health or relationships or, or businesses, or it, it doesn't matter, all kinds of stuff. But the, the promises and the faithfulness of God never changes. I wanted to talk to you today about Rabashaka. <laughs> I'm not even sure if that's how you say it. But uh, this is a story that has always just amazed me, uh, and I read it. It's, it appears a couple of times in the scriptures, but I'm going to read out of 2 Kings today, uh, and we'll start with chapter 18. But this is the story of Hezekiah, who was the king of uh, Judah, and <clears throat> um, Israel had kind of gone astray, or Judah had kind of gone astray, had some bad kings that happens, and, and uh, Hezekiah came in. He turned that, turned that ship around. And um, got got rid of the altars, you know, the out, uh, other than the Lord's altar and stuff. I mean, he did a good work. God was very pleased. Brought him back to the Lord. Brought him back to the temple and the altar. <clears throat> and so, just soon after that, uh, Assyria, who was a power powerful nation at that time, who'd been kind of rampaging, they came in on him and demanded uh, tribute or ransom. And Hezekiah wanted to keep the peace. You know, basically like we do. We're going like, what the heck? I'm born again. I'm like not a murderer or a liar or, the, you know, I'm like, I'm living a good life uh, and, and worshiping the Lord. And then what the heck? Why is all this stuff coming on me all of a sudden? Eh, happens. If <laughs> it happens, stuff just happens. Let me tell you. That's why I want to tell you this story today. <clears throat> so Hezekiah, after a while, uh, decides, look, this is getting too heavy. I'm done paying this gold or... I'm done serving, you know, giving tribute to this king of Assyria. So the king of Assyria sends his army, who's been out rampaging, destroying other nations, and doing the same thing, you know, hijacking, uh, and uh, the ISIS maybe of their day or something like that. Anyway, so they show up outside the walls of Jerusalem, and Hezekiah and, and his group, you know, they've done their preparations, but there's this huge army outside their walls, and this uh, representative of the king of Assyria is, uh, he's a Rabshaka, Rabashaka, Rabashaka, Hubashaka, Hubashaka, Rabashaka. Anyway, don't worry, you, you folks, don't worry about it. Just, that's, uh, that's an actual name. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, Rabashaka is like a title. He's maybe the lord of the armies or the, you know, the minister of defense, whatever. He's the big guy on the battlefield. His name is Shenacherib, as I understand it. So he comes up and he's surrounding the walls and they begin to talk to the elders and the city leaders on the wall that Hezekiah, the king, has sent out to see what the demands are. Ch 2 Kings chapter 18 and in verse uh, 19. <clears throat> so the Rabshaka, Rabshaka, I like saying it, said to them, yelling up to them on the wall, now tell Hezekiah, thus says the great king, the king of Assyria, what is this confidence that you have, Jerusalem and Hezekiah? What's this great confidence to stand up against me? You say, I have counsel and strength for the war. Now, whom do you rely on for this strength that you've rebelled against me? This is Shenacherib talking to Hezekiah and the men on the wall. Now behold, you rely on the staff of this crushed reed, even Egypt, which on, if a man leans, it will go into his hand and pierce it. You know, unreliable Pharaoh and the armies at that time, had, you know, they would make the contracts. They would say, we'll be your, you know, big brother, we'll come help you. But they were kind of like, oh, they find reasons we couldn't come or this didn't happen. They were unreliable. Mm. 
So he goes on in verse 22, but if you say to me, we trust in the Lord, our God, is it not he, the Lord, whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah has taken away and has said to Judah and to Jerusalem, you're going to worship here at this altar in this temple. Basically what Rabbi Shaka, uh, Shaka, Shennacherib is saying here, uh, when Hezekiah went through the land and restored the worship, the true worship to one altar and one temple and brought the people back and destroyed the altars of the Ashtras and the Kichimas and the goat gods, all that other stuff. This, the world point of view, these guys out here, let's just call that darkness. The darkness view is you're limiting options of people. You've Listen, people, Hezekiah has trapped you into you've got to believe it my way or no way. He's saying to you there's only one way to worship God. He's saying there's only one way that you can come to God. He's limited your choices. Uh, he's just, he's a hater. That's what this guy is saying. So he goes on, blah, 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 blah. And he gets down a little further in, in chapter 18 of 2 Kings and verse 25, he says, talking to the king of, uh, of Israel, this Rabbi Shaka says, now, have I come up without the Lord's approval against this place to destroy it? The Lord said to me, go up against this land and destroy it. There it is. There it is. God sent me on a mission. I'm here to take you over and do good for you. Trust me, I'm here to help you. Ah, anyway, so how many times people in your life or your own mind, that's the thing I'm going at, your own thoughts and your own minds and well-meaning people say, well, maybe you've done something wrong and maybe this is to learn a lesson that the reason things are going wrong and this oppression and and this debt and maybe this broken relationship or businesses that have failed you know maybe maybe god's trying to teach you something and uh, blah 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 the lord sent me this is a message this is from god this wonderful blessing of poverty or lack or 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 sickness or disease that's from god god sent me to you that's what cancer says god sent me to you that's just craziness that is pathological i'm sorry I hope I haven't lost you yet. James tells us, James, the book of James tells us in, in chapter one, if you go down there towards the end, it says that every good and every perfect gift comes down from the Father above and the Father of lights, in whom there is no variableness nor shadow of turning. And in that same passage, it says, God is not tempted, cannot be tempted, and is not tempted by any man. Neither does he tempt any man. God is good. God doesn't send disease or sickness or poverty or light. Now, can you learn during those times? Yeah, duh. You learn about faith and you learn about patience. You learn about the finished work of Christ. You learn to lean on God and trust on God. Give me a break. If you believe this season is from God, then why are you fighting it? God will help you come through it. Did God send Daniel the lion's den or the three Hebrew children the fire? I guess you could philosophically argue the point, but you'd be philosophically wrong. No, the world did it. Stuff happens in the world. Jesus himself said in the, in the, in the, in the New Testament, in this world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. That's what he said. Now, if the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, baby Jesus, says to you, in this world you'll have tribulation, well then, do you think that's his will? No, I don't think that's what he's saying. I'm just saying, I believe he's telling you, that's going to come. That's going to come. That's just part of the world. That's like saying, I, now that I've taken a shower, I'm never going to get dirty again. Well, that's just dumb. The world's full of dirt and you could stay inside. Stay inside, don't even move for three days. And tell me, you don't need a shower? Anyway, stuff happens, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the stuff. That's what Jesus said in my version. 
All right, so here's this guy out there saying, the Lord sent me. Now, he's telling the truth. He really is telling the truth because he had gone and destroyed several different lands. If you go down here and read in verse 34 and on, and we'll read a little bit further, uh, Shanachrib, the Rab, Rabashak, Rabshaka, Rabshaka, had been sent by God, had been sent by God as a hammer, a hammer on the nations. In other words, someone to be the bigger and badder power than all of the bad people out there. In other words, God sent somebody bigger than Hitler when Hitler was, was threatening the world and killing people and destroying people. And God said, all right, I got a bigger hammer. God raised up the United States and allies to be a bigger hammer, to bring justice to a, to, to a, a people and an evil that would have overtaken the world. So God does this. He did this even to Jerusalem and Israel uh, earlier. He had, uh, uh, he had warned them and prophesied and prophesied. And then by the, by the end there, he, he sends Babylon raises up the kingdom of Babylon who comes in and is sent by God to take Jerusalem and Israel captive for 70 years out of their land. They were warned, they were prophesied to, they had chances to repent, and some did good, some did bad, but then, okay. So here's the deal. This is the way life is. It's gonna come to you and tell you the Lord sent me. And it's gonna tell you this, look at this, let's go back up. Here, 2 Kings chapter 18. Look up here a minute uh, in verse 31 of chapter 18 of 2 Kings. Uh, this is the Rabshakeh talking to Hezekiah and the people on the wall. They're all listening. Listen to what he's saying and, sound, let me, and see if this sounds familiar to you. Uh, for the king of Assyria wants to tell you, Hezekiah, and to all the people sitting here hearing our words and seeing this great army, he wants you to make peace with me and come out to me and eat all of you eat of your own vine and your own fig tree and drink each of the waters of your own cistern until, if you'll surrender basically, you can stay in your land and do whatever you want to until I finally come and take you away to a land like your own. It's just like yours. And we're going to take you there, a land of olive trees and vineyards and bread and new wine and grain and trees and honey that you may live and not die. In other words, surrender to me, trust me, cross my heart, trust me, surrender to me, and I'm gonna take you to a better place. Utopia, says every politician. I guess I didn't have to say that, sorry. Anyway, so he goes on in uh, verse, uh, let's see, that looks like 32. But then he points to the people again, he goes, but do not, Listen to Hezekiah when he misleads you, saying, the Lord will deliver us. Misleads you. When Jesus and the Word says, when 1 Peter 2.24 or Isaiah 53.5 tell you that by his stripes, Jesus, the stripes on his back, you were healed. Is he misleading you? Isn't the doctor and the sickness and, and people and the world and even your own thoughts worrying against you because you haven't seen it yet? Trying to say, well, the Lord's not going to, the, the Lord's, the Lord's not going to, the, the Lord can't deliver you. That's what Shanachrib, that sickness is saying. The Lord can't deliver you. I mean, what about Aunt Sally? She was way more spiritual than you and she died of cancer. That's, that's how it goes. That's how the enemy talks. He gets up there and says, the Lord sent me. First of all, you're not that good. You broke a promise. And this came on to you because God's trying to teach you a lesson. And I'm here to, I'm here to, to make that lesson happen. Now, we've got people in, in government that tell us this all the time. You guys are bad people. Hey, my stuff went down. Sorry. Got to have that. Doesn't look as cool. We have people in government all the time. That's their favorite thing to do is to tell you, Everybody else was evil. Every group is evil and everything in the past was evil. And we're here to change it and set you free finally and take you to a better place. Trust us. Give us all of your guns. Give us all of your health care. Give us all of your information. Give us all of your welfare. Give us all of your water. 
Give us all of everything and we will take care of you and you'll have olive trees and it will all be a love fest and a utopia. See, this is not, this is nothing new. This is what man does. This is what religions do. This is what man does. This is Satan's biggest signature. There's only one person that can make those promises and that's the Lord God Almighty. And he fulfilled that promise. That's why we have the Lord Jesus, his son, that God sent here for us. He is the promise. He is the guarantor. He said, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. Once you receive me, I'm going to receive, you're going to have that Holy Spirit in you who is a guarantee of these promises. Anyway, let's go on. Look back down here. Verse 33 of 2 Kings. He says, is any of the kings still talking to Hezekiah on the wall? He says, has, has any of these other kings around here delivered... Uh, delivered uh, themselves from the hand of the king? Have their gods uh, stopped this army? No, none of their gods. They were praying as hard as you were. They were worshiping as hard as you were. And somebody came in and dropped bombs on them and, and blasted them and killed them and cut their heads off and boom, 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 boom. So what do you think, Israel? What do you think, Judah? What do you think, Christians? Do you think your God can, can deliver you from us? Yeah. So look at verse 36, because this is important for you. Here was the response, this first response from the people that were listening to all this. But the people were silent. Don't answer that crap. Don't answer that. Sorry, mom. And he answered, they answered him not a word for the king's commandment was do not answer him. There we go. What's our king's commandment today? Don't answer the darkness. The answer to the darkness is flip on the light. Turn on the light. Every time that comes to you and those thoughts come to you, turn on the light. Here's your answer. Jesus is my healing. Jesus is my salvation. Jesus Christ is my hope and my eternal life and my protection and my provision. Jesus the Christ. Well, no, you don't let that Jesus guy deceive you, Daryl. What has he done? I mean, are you rolling in the dough? <laughs> no, but let me tell you something. I got food. I got shelter. I got clothes. I have a wonderful family. All of us are born again and serving God. I'm transportation. I've got gainful employment. I've got stuff. I mean, the stuff is just stuff, but the revelation of the word is priceless. Looking at the Christ. Looking at the Christ. Here's my answer to you, darkness. Rabashaka, Rabashaka. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. I got him. You got nothing. So here's what happens in this story, and I'm not going to dwell on it too much. Hezekiah goes there. Read it in the next chapter, chapter 19. If you go over, <clears throat> you're going to see uh, he prays. God, uh, Hezekiah goes and prays and gets an answer from God. And God says, don't be afraid of the words of this guy. He says, the, the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. God said that, has blasphemed him. This is personal now. Just like this sickness and this disease and this poverty and this lack and this broken homes and, and this broken businesses and, and hopelessness and despair in the body of Christ, guess what? God takes that personal. That is not an attack against his kids. That is an attack against him, trying to say your dad, your father in heaven, and the Lord Jesus Christ, your savior, they can't help you. Look at the situation you're in. Look how long you've been in it. Who else has been delivered from it? God goes on to say in verse 37, I'm sorry, seven of 2 Kings 19, Behold, I'll put a spirit in that guy, in the darkness, the guy with the big mouth. I'm going to put a spirit in him so that he'll hear a rumor and he'll walk away from here. And he will die by the sword in his own land. All right, goes on further. <coughs> Shennacherib wants a little bit more of this. He wants a little bit more of the Saxon. So he comes back again and he, uh, he starts to say this in the language. 
Oh, well, the, a rumor came. If you go, if you see verse eight and nine there, right under it, just like God had prophesied, a rumor comes that Cush or another land had invaded his homeland of Assyria. And so the Rabshakeh, he's got to head back to, to do the business of defending his kingdom. So he comes out right before he goes to go one more time, you know, don't listen to Hezekiah. Verse 10, 2 Kings 19, Thus you shall say to Hezekiah, king of Judah, Do not let your God, in whom you trust, deceive you, saying, Jerusalem will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Do not let your God deceive you, saint, believing that your body won't be he believing that your body's going to be healed and not be given over to death and to cancer and to disease and sickness. Don't be deceived that your children are going to be lost. Don't be deceived that God can save that as your destiny. Don't believe it. That's what you're hearing. And this is who it is. Shennacherib was listening to that same dark spirit, that same dark demonic presence that's here that Ephesians 6 talks about. Rulers of wickedness and darkness and principalities and powers in high places. The people are just the pawns. Ooh. I've been a puppet, a poet, a pirate, a, po a pawn, and a king. I've been up and... Okay, never mind. Not a poet. All right. That is the words of Satan. That guy's mouth is moving, but it's Satan who's saying it. So you've heard what cancer can do to people. You've seen it, maybe. And you've heard what, what uh, poverty and lack and insufficiency what oil costs and grocery costs and, and healthcare costs and every other stupid thing. It's yelling at you every day saying, your God can't keep you from this. This is the end times, right? This is the end times. Oh, it's gonna be terrible. I got news for you. The promises of God have no expiration date. There is nowhere in the word that says the promises of God will somehow magically dissipate as we get closer to the end. It's impossible for God to lie. The promises of God are Jesus Christ and all the promises of God in him are yes and in him, Christ Jesus, amen. The promises of God to protect and keep and heal you and save you and redeem you and give you eternal life and provide for you and protect you are still valid. They're still working. The Bible tells us to don't be deceived, dear brother. Don't be deceived. Wake up and understand that darkness is trying to make you believe a lie. Don't be weary in doing good. Stay in there. Keep your faith strong. All right, let's finish this. So, uh, uh, Shennacherib has his last words, blah, 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 my God, blah, 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 your God, blah, 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 blah. And then he goes back to his tents, prepares to leave the next morning to go back to his land. Well, that night, that afternoon, Hezekiah goes back to prayer, lays out this letter and these words <coughs> that, uh, that had been told to him and the people. In front of God, he says this. And he says uh, down there in verse 16 of 2 uh, Kings 19, he says, Lord, incline your ear, hear us, open your eyes, O Lord, and see, listen to the words of Shennacherib, which he has sent to reproach the living God. Truly, O Lord, the kings of Assyria have devastated the nations around us and their lands by this guy and have cast their gods into the fire. But here's the key, they weren't gods. It's easy to beat someone who's trusting a God that's not a God. The whole world out there right now is trusting a God that's not a God. They call it education or man or science or any other stupidity that they put their trust in. I got news for you, that's easy to defeat. You got no covering, you got no protection. Is, what guy do you, what man do you, what man do you trust? Tell me, where is your foundation that you have such trust in what man that he's not going to lie to you, take advantage of you, and steal everything you have? What man? Anyway, blah. So anyway, he goes, hey, we see that their God's been cast into the fire, so they had no protection. But our God, he says, down in verse 19, we pray and deliver uh, uh, pr we pray that you deliver us from his hand that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you, God, are God alone. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Basically, here's the answer of God. Verse 22, 
he's answering Hezekiah. And he says about Shennacherib, he's speaking directly to him prophetically and, and speaking uh, through the prophet Isaiah. He says, whom, big boy, have you reproached and blasphemed? And against who have you raised your voice and haughtily lift up, lifted up your eyes? Against the Holy One of Israel. That's who. Go down a little further. Verse 25. This is the scary part for you, darkness. God says, have you not heard? Long ago I did this. I spoke of this. I did it. From ancient times I planned it. He goes, I brought it to pass now that you should turn, you, Shennacherib, and a king of Assyria should turn fortified cities into ruinous heaps. That was my plan to use you as a hammer. But you got all cocky, all amped up, and you decided old hatreds die, die hard. Don't like those Jews much. And we're going to go over there and hammer them. God takes that kind of personal. Mm, 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 mm. Mm, mm, mm. Anyway, here's the scary part. God looks at him, verse 7, 27. <laughs> God's talking to Shennacherib and he says I know where you live <laughs> I know you're going out and you're coming in and I know you're raging against me and because of your raging against me and because your arrogance has come up to my ear Therefore, I will put my hook in your nose and my bridle in your lips and I will turn you back by the way which you came. And that's what we see happen. He gets the rumor from back that some army's coming against him. Well, that night goes to bed. Verse 35, it says, and that night, before he gets up the next morning to go home, it happened that night that the angel of the Lord went out and struck 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. And when men rose up early in the morning, survivors, behold, all of them were dead. They didn't hear anything. They didn't hear anything. The men that survived woke up and all they saw was 185,000 dead people. I see. Now, I said all that to say this today. There's a couple of things I have learned about life. And one of them is propaganda. I mean, propaganda. Oh my goodness. Left and right, left and right, everybody's got an ax to grind. You know what we're supposed to do as people of the kingdom? Preach the Christ. Here's the deal. Jesus Christ finished this work for you for your healing, for your abundance and prosperity, for your health and wholeness. You mean I don't have to go through stuff? Yeah, you're going to go through stuff. That's life. Like I said, in this life, you're going to have tribulation, but be of good cheer. You're going to go through it and come out because of Jesus Christ. His body was brutalized on the way to that cross. Now listen to me carefully. It says they didn't even recognize him. Isaiah tells us this. And prophetically said, by the time they were finished broken and podding and beaten and spearing and putting thorns and striping and nailing, by the time they were done and he got there, he said, you couldn't even recognize him. Not, and hardly recognize his form as a man, it said. I mean, the guy was a meat, just a bloody pulp. Now, why do I tell you that? Because in the Old Testament, if you go study the high priesthood and you go study the, the sacrifices, one of the most critical components is you got to have blood. Without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sin. I mean, from day one, outside the garden, that's what Abel did. Excuse me. I keep losing my light back here. So Abel brought an offering of blood and the sheep a sweet smelling savor accepted by God. So from the very beginning, blood was to atone. But the second principle was <clears throat> the lamb 
or the ram or whatever that sacrifice was that was called for had to be without spot or blemish. That means not even a discoloration, not a blemish where the hair shorter here, an ear has a in it or something, or tails kinked some way weird. That, that would be unacceptable. That was the priest's job. When you came, priest didn't much care what you were repenting of and sacrificing for. Between you and God, his job was to examine the sacrifice. So he looks at you, and he's not looking at you, he's going, all right. And he looks around, looks behind the ears, checks them up, boom, 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 good. And then they lay your hands on them, confess your sin, boom, gone. Blood shed, remiss, sins remitted for you. Uh, and Bob's your uncle. And so uh, when it comes to the perfect lamb, in fact, is it Leviticus or somewhere up there? It gives a whole list of, man, if you come and they're mutilated or any of this stuff is done, it's unacceptable. And that's bad news. So here's Jesus and his body, the perfect lamb. And they beat him mercilessly and crown of thorns into his head, beating him and bruising him and stripe him. 40, 39 of these stripes just rip him to shreds where meat is just hanging off his body. And then they, or it's, they continue to mock him. And then they put those spikes in his hands and in his feet and pull him up there. And then they stick him with a spear and all kinds. I mean, just on and on. He is brutalized. Then he's unacceptable as an offering unless something else is going on here. Because that lamb, by the time he was crucified, in other words, by the time he died, he was not perfect. So understand there's a reason that happened because that flesh and bone body, a body you have prepared for me, the psalmist said, prophesying of the Christ, talking to his father. You didn't desire, you know, sacrifice and burn offering, but a body you prepared for me so that I can get this done once and for all. And this body is for this purpose. This flesh body is for this purpose so that I can take all of the sickness, I can take the chastisement for their peace, I can take the, the brutalization and the thorns in the head to reverse that curse of the sweat of the brow you've got to earn, the ground's not going to give for you anymore, but that blood poured across that forehead with the thorns, the very thorns that would grow from that curse in the garden, but now reversed, pierced in the hands, everything that you put your hand to prospers, pierced in the feet wherever you walk, the gospel will uh, put, your, put your foot on, will prosper, or you'll have. Anyway, that was for this life. His body was for this life, for your body. Heck, I don't need healing in heaven. When I get my new body, I don't need healing. It's a new body. It didn't get healed. It got rebuilt, remade reconstructed from the ground up and by ground I mean molecule up so and I, I guess here's where I'm trying to go to today when it says in Corinthians Paul says celebrate the death of the Lord Jesus Christ till he comes with this communion he says a little bit earlier you know many are weak and sickly and die prematurely because they fail to discern the body of Christ when they're taking this in other words they come and you think the, the, the bread and the wine is just one thing. Hey, thank you, God. Appreciate it. But he's saying, no, discern the body of Christ. That body is different than the blood. There's two separate elements. We break that bread and say, this is my bread that was broken for me. The body of Jesus Christ. He said, Jesus himself said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part with me. Do you understand that eating this is not transubstantiation? He doesn't become Jesus' body in your mouth. It is faith that's saying that body on the tree, that bruised, battered, bloodied, and unrecognizable embarrassment on the tree, saying a humiliation defeat the world's eyes is our victory. That's our victory. We look at that and say, because his body's that way, my body's healed if I'm in Christ Jesus. Because his body's that way, he is provided for me. Because his body's that way, the ground gives for me now. Because 
his body's that way. I don't have to live with that anymore. So we take that communion and we thank God for that body and that bread and we eat that bread and say, thank you, Father. This is my food, my health, my provision, my protection, my life, Jesus Christ. And that blood is, is the atonement and the washing away and the, uh, uh, the remission, not the, rem yeah, the remission and the just thrown away, the sins gone once and for all, cleaned. So today when the enemy comes to worship or to whisper in your ear that you've done something wrong, that somehow the Lord has sent this thing that you're in as a lesson. Well, I got news for you. The lessons are in scripture. The lessons are taught by the Holy Spirit, not by circumstance. You're going to go through circumstances, and you can learn in those circumstances. But the Word is the teacher. Holy Spirit is the teacher that opens the Word, the words that Jesus spoke to us and brings life out of them. The words that I speak are life, are spirit, and they are life. That's what Jesus said in John chapter 6, I think. So today, I want to encourage you. Don't give up. Don't throw it over. Don't believe the lies of the enemy. Shut up. Don't talk to him. Just tell him, talk to, talk to my Savior. Jesus Christ is my answer. He's my healing. He's my provision. I don't know how it's going to happen. I don't know where it's going to come from. But he is well able because my Father loves me. For God so loved the world and me that he sent Jesus Christ. Now put your trust in him. We live by the gospel. It didn't just get us born again. The gospel is how we live. The good news of what Jesus finished. It is finished. And that's what I say to you today. About the circumstance and about the fear and about the depression and about the lack and about the, uh, the brokenness dreams and visions and hopes for the future that have been shattered and broken and you've given up on it is finished new days come there's a new sheriff in town his name is jesus and he's not just for salvation he's for every day he's for eternity he is for us all thanks for listening and i hope you have a, a, a great rest of the week and i bless you god is good.